Over recent years, the name GT has been heavily misused. It's now associated with hot hatchbacks and small cars with great pretensions. In fact, the name GT is associated and should be associated with fast, sleek, long-legged machines that can get you from A to B with enormous speed and comfort and still enjoy yourself. This is the Mitsubishi 3000 and it is a real GT. It's been maligned by critics, it's been referred to as the medallion man's car and indeed even the Power Rangers transport. But that really says more about the critics than it does the car. I've produced many pieces of music for the record industry. And sometimes you can actually have the right song and the right artist, but still not chart because of some twist in the fashion itself. This too happens in the motor industry. Like the late 60s FF Jensen Interceptor, this 3000 is widely misunderstood. That Jensen was a high-tech showcase. It incorporated the future four-wheel drive, which is now on supercars. It had anti-lock brakes, which was ahead of ABS. It had all manner of electric devices, power steering, but yet only 400 were sold. This 1993 Mitsubishi is also four-wheel drive and was designed purely initially for the Japanese marketplace as a flagship to counter the Nissan GTs, the Honda NSXs and even the Toyota Supra. It showed off all Mitsubishi's know-how and was really embroiled in one simple supercar. America admired this car a lot and asked for it to be imported and as a result this went on sale both as the GTO and as the Dodge Stealth. Then, in 1995, Mitsubishi introduced it here into the UK, but it had to have stronger gearbox, it ended up with a German one, and more power and bigger brakes, because we here in Europe tend to drive our cars a good deal harder than the Americans. Unfortunately for Mitsubishi, the GT climate was still in the post-yuppie Porsche 911 era. So what do they include within this great package? Well, under here, there is a 281 brake horsepower engine. It's 24 valve. It's a V6 with a turbo for each of the V sections. It has a top speed limited to 155 miles an hour. God knows what it would really go to if it was released. It also has sensors which read the drive and exactly what the car's weight is doing and will compute and reset the shock absorbers continuously. It has an active aerodynamic with a kind of ground effect with the front spoiler moving 50 millimeters when it's traveling over 50 miles an hour and a rear wing that moves about 14 degrees to help downforce. This cancels below 31 miles an hour. That enables, of course, maximum down pressure. It has permanent four-wheel drive which gives enormous grip and race-proven double wishbone suspension which is refined by a computer and is switchable here on the dashboard between sport and tour. It also boasts four-wheel steering and their, their research, unlike some of the other manufacturers, have suggested that the benefits on twisty and wet roads is in fact having the rear wheels steer in the same direction the, the front as opposed to some of the other manufacturers that actually have a reverse process. This only operates above 30 miles an hour but it helps cornering enormously and as a result they're able to concentrate on a setup for the road with straight line performance not having to concern themselves with whether or not it'll topple as your double bends appear.
driving this car over long distances, which I have, it's incredibly safe and sure-footed. Because it's got four-wheel drive and four-wheel steering, and because the suspension is reading the road continuously and changing, um, it really, you're driving so much within its limits, it's hard to judge it. And without being very irresponsible with road conditions and other users, there's nothing I can do to prove here and now where its limits are. It's sufficient to say that as a Grand Tourer, it really is very safe. Some of the switch gears are a little strange and old fashioned. On the driver's seat, there are electrical controls, and if you press it once to take the car seat forward, it keeps going. You take your hand off, and you're sending yourself under the dash. You have to press it a second time, and that's irritating when we're now used to touch sensitive one stop switching. And to the dashboard, too. The controls for the heater have been given quite a bad press. In actual fact, they're very simple. They're very similar to the BMW ones. There is a display screen, and on that it will show you the different air flows, the, whether it's recycled or incoming air. You dial the temperature up, and really it takes care of everything else itself. It's the sort of simple switch gear that Mike Rutherford would have on audio, and sadly that isn't on here.